welcome to this first of the discovery classes. This should be, uh, this is going to be an exciting journey. We're going to be taking a trip. We're going to be taking a trip to God in the next several weeks. I apologize that we're starting a couple of weeks late, but uh, we are at least starting. So uh, let's begin tonight with uh, an Our Father. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'll start with a, a personal story it happened to me a couple of decades ago. And uh, one of our daughters always liked to, to do these, these radio uh, ticket things. You know, she, you call in and get, you get tickets to various events. And so she was always trying to call in for tickets to this or that. And she got tickets to a Hubble telescope exhibit. Now this was in the late 1990s. And so the Hubble telescope wasn't really new but uh, we know we didn't have all of the uh, images uh, available to us like we do now because you know, the internet was not uh, as, as well utilized then as it is now. And, um, so the Hubble telescope was kind of a big deal and they had a nice uh, exhibit of it uh, there at Union Station. And so we went to look at, the, at the, these photographs from the Hubble telescope and they were just fascinating. They were just so gorgeous, the, the beauty of, um, the various nebula and, uh, and, the, and the various uh, space photographs that were being taken by the Hubble telescope were just fascinating and uh, were really something of, of uh, a considerable beauty. When well, I came across one photograph in particular, and I, I remember it very vividly, it was, it was a, a nice, beautiful photograph, and it was all these stars of varying colors and shapes. And so it was, it was eye-catching because usually I think of stars as just being, you know, points of light. But these are all kinds of different colors and shapes. And then as I'm reading the, the caption about it, I discover these are, these are not stars, actually. These are all photographs of galaxies. That there were about 700 galaxies pictured in this one image, which was described as being taken uh, through a dark part of the sky that was about the size of a postage stamp. And just because our own solar system and planet is kind of on the edge of our galaxy, we, so, there are a few small places that we can actually peer outside our galaxy into the spaces beyond. And we've all kind of heard the numbers, you know, trillions of galaxies, each having billions of stars. And that, that number just doesn't mean much to us. But yet, as I looked at this particular photograph that represented about a postage stamp sized piece of the night sky and saw about 700 galaxies in what was referred to as, at that time as the deep field photograph, my first reaction was, my God is too small. That I'm looking at this piece of the universe that is so huge and so massive. I thought, I need to expand my understanding of God to fit this huge understanding that we have of the universe. And this is an issue I think that a lot of people have. We see people uh, coming up in life, and of course, you know how it is. We, we, we bring them to, uh, to church, they go through their, you know, young people, they go through their PSR classes and they prepare for their first communion and they learn some Bible stories and they color some pictures of Jesus and they, they memorize some prayers and, they, and they've developed, you know, a seven-year-old's understanding of God. And indeed, they, you know, they, they can kind of get through life 
at least through the beginning of life that way. They have an understanding of God and, and that's okay for them. And some of them may come back for confirmation, but you know, I used to teach confirmation class. And quite frankly, one of the things that um, I noticed in teaching you know, to go to conference, to be confirmed, their, their graduation stamp and, and move on, they're satisfying their parents. And their biggest interest, of course, is, you know, developing boyfriends and girlfriends. And they're thinking maybe about college or, or life or career. This relationship that we're, that we're trying to bring them to a point of, of a knowledge of God is just not foremost on their minds at that time. So they have, you know, a lot of Catholics really haven't had a great deal of theological formation outside of early childhood. And then what happens is they go to college, right? I think we've seen this happen with a lot of people, with a lot of perhaps of, of our friends or, or of our, our relatives, maybe our own children. They go to college and suddenly the universe seems bigger than God. They begin to, to see as, as they start to go through the college classes how huge the world is and how big the universe is. And, and the little concept of God they developed in their PSR classes when they were six or seven years old just doesn't seem to make it anymore. And in fact, how many people have you known that I've known that at some point in their early 20s, they stop praying to God and they start praying to the universe. After all, goodness gracious, the universe seems bigger than, to them than God is. And they begin to pray to the universe and talk about the universe does this and the universe does that. They've really shifted their understanding away from a God who is bigger than the universe to some kind of God that's maybe smaller than the universe. But it all comes down to the, this issue of, of their own understanding of God. They've never grown from a childhood understanding of God into an adult understanding of God. And because of that, they don't know exactly where God fits in their life anymore. And so, you know, like a typical college student, they've got things going on in life and and God's probably not the top of the list. So God goes on a shelf, right? He's like one of those little elves that sits on the shelf. God goes on a shelf and they think, well, when they ever need God, then they'll, they'll know where he is. But they don't know where he is. And so as, as they go through life, and That's the steam I'm hearing. Okay, I'm hearing, I'm thinking I'm hearing a radio in the background. No, that's the steam heat kicking in that I'm listening to. Okay, sorry for that distraction. No, it's, it's being recorded. So as they get to that point that they need God, they just don't know where to find him. They're not sure how to relate to him. They've, they've, they've kind of become lost. You know, they go on in life, they get married, they have children, they have a mortgage, they have jobs, they get so busy. But then something happens that, that draws them, that they need God and they don't know where to find them. Now, the questions that, that come to mind that we face in life is that, you know, when you've got the mortgage due and there's not enough money to make the mortgage because you've had a refrigerator broke down and you had to pay for a new refrigerator and, and your car is breaking down, it's, it's all, they always seem to snowball, right? And, and you get to that point, you're not sure how you're gonna make it to the, in, into the next month. And the question is, is your God bigger than that? Or is the universe going to get you through that situation? When we're dealing with a sick child and we're not certain where the child is going to be able to survive, is our God bigger than that sick child? When we lose a loved one, a parent or a friend, is God bigger than that loss? So 
there, there are a number of different false concepts of God that people develop, uh, particularly in early life. And these are the concepts that wind up leading us into atheism. One of the things that I, I, I asked as we were talking about developing this, this very talk is that how can some atheists be right? We don't want to think atheists are right, but they can be right because their concept of God is one such that that God does not exist. It is a made up God. It's not the God that is there for them. You know, when I, when I grew up, of course I grew up in the 50s and it was a very, very different era. And the understanding that we got of, I got of God as a kid growing up, that it was a God set on a throne out there somewhere and kind of, um, you know, kind of moved people around like, like pieces on a chessboard. He did things like kind of manipulated people and manipulated life like, like someone who'd be, be playing with, with pieces. In fact, when I was a kid, we used to sing a song and uh, which went like this, it said, somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for those who trust him and obey. Obviously, I was not raised Catholic. I was raised in a Southern evangelical uh, tradition. And we would sing that. And so we would think that God was out there somewhere sitting on a throne doing things for us if we could talk him into it. And while that's probably a pretty good description of, a, of a, God, a God from Greek or Roman mythologies. That's not a description of, of our God. It's not a description of the God of the universe. And if that's what we develop in our young life, that that's what our understanding of God is, that, that he's out there somewhere and suddenly we see how big the universe is and he doesn't, we're not sure where he is and we can lose sight of him. And, and that's one of those misconceptions that actually leads people into atheism. And some people view God as a supersized version of ourselves, that, that he's very human-like. Right? And, we, and we, we need to try to talk him into things. You know, he's like a super superman. And he believes in truth and justice in the American way. And when things happen in our lives that just don't seem to fit to our understanding of God, well, you know, why isn't our super superman saving the day? Why isn't he fixing things? Why isn't he taking care of things the way that, that he should? And that's, again, one of those conceptions of God that leads people into atheism, because if we expect God to be superman, we're going to be let down. And then some people develop a, a version of God that he's almost like a vending machine, that, that if you can you know, he, he doles out miracles if we can get the right formula, if we can say the right prayers in the right way or, or do the right things or the right acts of devotion, and, and if we can somehow force God's hand to dole out a miracle for us. You know, that's actually probably not a bad description of Santa Claus. We want to get on the nice list and not the naughty list, right? If we're on the nice list, then God's going to take care of us. And if we're on the naughty list, well, then he's not. And that is one of those, again, one of those concepts of God that leads people to atheism because those gods don't exist. They're figments of imagination. And they're figments that people like to believe in because it gives them some element of control. If God is someone who will hand out a miracle, if I just punch the right buttons, then we, that gives me some element of control over God. But all of those perceptions of God lead to confusion, disillusionment, disappointment with God, and ultimately to loss of faith. So who is God? How do we know what God is like? And the way for us to do that is to listen to what God has to say about himself. 
I always like to go back to the, the story of Moses at the burning bush. See, Moses was an interesting character. He was raised in, uh, in the courts of Egypt. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. And so he was raised with a great understanding of all the gods of Egypt and uh, how they interplayed and interacted with each other, their battles and their squabbles, and the various magical incantations that you would use to control these gods, to try to placate these gods, to make these gods be kind to you. See, most, of, most pagan religion has to do with, with two things, how to, how to placate God and how to get God's favor. It's all about me trying to manipulate God. And that's the way Moses was raised. And unfortunately, that's the ways a lot of Americans, even in the church, are raised. That we're looking for ways that we can keep God from being angry and get God to give us favors. But Moses, raised in, in, in the house of Egypt, he comes across a very strange event. He comes across a burning bush. There's a bush that is a fire but it's not being consumed. Now, the, the scriptures usually refer to it as a burning bush. That's probably not a great translation. It's, it's a bush, but it's glowing, it's shining, it's radiating. I mean, the, the, the Hebrew language did not have a lot of vocabulary. And so when, in Hebrew, they're trying to express things, um, there's, they don't have a lot of choices of words they can use to express them. So when it talks about the burning bush, think of it in terms of a radiating bush, a bush that's emanating energy. And Moses sees this and he realizes it's something special. And the voice, of course, comes out of the bush that says, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. And so Moses does that. He takes off his shoes. He's standing there before this, this glowing or radiating, burning bush. And he asks the logical question for someone who is raised in the courts of Egypt. What is your name? See, he doesn't know what God he's talking to. He wants to know what God this is. What's this God's name? Because all magical incantations in Egypt begin with the God's name. You can't, you can't make an incantation if you don't know who it is that you're making the incantation to. So he asks this bush, what is your name? And then comes the reply. That is one of the most profound experiences of any human anywhere at any time. God responds to Moses and he says, I am, I am. That's not much of a name. God's name is I am. Now, we, 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 when we sing, the, see this song sometimes in music or sometimes in some translations of the Bible, you see that spelled Y-A-H-W-E-H. -H -E and because it's it takes these Hebrew letters that are really a form of the Hebrew verb to be. Yihye is the Hebrew verb to be. And it takes these letters and we try to pronounce it in various different ways. Because how do we call God I am? When God gives his name, his I am, he is pointing out that he is not some supreme being in the midst of a pantheon of supreme beings who fight and bicker and, and, and do all the things, you know, all the human characteristics we like to ascribe to God. He is saying that he is all being. God is all being. God is all that is. I am.
But then he goes on and he specifies, he clarifies that with, again, two more Hebrew words. And one of those words is chesed. And chesed is, again, a word because Hebrew's got such a limited vocabulary that can be translated in a lot of different ways, a lot of different nuances to that word. But the word can be translated love, compassion, mercy, pity. God says that he is not a being, supreme or otherwise. God is all being, and that being is, interacts with us in love and mercy, compassion, kindness. God defines himself as being that interacts in love, mercy, compassion, and kindness. And then there's a second Hebrew word, and when you read in the scriptures, you could, you, you'll see how that all plays out. But that second Hebrew word is emet, which again can be translated a number of different ways truth, faithfulness, fidelity, constancy. God is explaining who he is by what he is. And he is all that is. And he interacts with us through love and through truth. We want to place God out there somewhere. We want to make God something apart from us, something separated from us. But the very nature of God is that he relates to us. He relates to us in truth and in love. He's not a member of some circus of gods that bicker and argue. He is all and in all. St. Paul gives him, talks about him in that way. God is all and is in all. In other words, God is I am. God is all being. There is nothing that exists that does not exist in God. St. Peter says, in him we live and move and have our being. Most of us imagine some separation between us and God. We even imagine some separation between the universe and God. But see, this is the exciting part. In the incarnation, God becomes flesh. There is no longer any separation between God, between creator and creation. We are all brought together into one. It's a great act of wholeness that we are made whole when we are made one with God and one with one another. That's the whole meaning of the Catholic Church, of the Catholic faith, that we are brought together in wholeness. Prior to Christ, every place had a God, and they were considered to be Lo local, they, they, were, they were just little local deities that, that you would have. And there were so many of them. In Athens alone, there were 66,000 different deities. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> they had 66,000 different deities. And most of them controlled some little spot a grove of trees or a spring or a house or th there was all these little spots of, for all these little deities. Interestingly, you know, the Romans were the same thing. They, in they inherited all of the Greek gods and they made up some of their own. And you know what God in, in Rome was more prayed to than any other? Was the god Fortuna. The God of good luck. <laughs> P 
People have this have always had this desire to see God as separated from them and trying to placate God or trying to win his favor, try to get something from God. But in the incarnation, we see that there is no separation between creator and creation. God became flesh. He is all and he is in all. In him we live and move and have our being. One of the things that I've noticed, and, and I've talked to so many people who have had this experience, I've had this experience my four, myself before a number of times, and when you're, you know, you, you get it, you're in prayer, and suddenly everything seems to change. That somehow your connection to God is so much more intense and you realize that you have connected somehow to God. And the most common description I have ever heard of that experience is, is this. People said, it was like I was suddenly floating in an ocean of love. And some of you may have had that very experience. Or you've had an experience that you say, okay, that, that sounds right. Floating in an ocean of love consumed by God all around because in him we live and move and are. The story goes of, of a couple of fish who were swimming around and they were um, talking about fish things, you know, whatever fish talk about. And uh, they, as they were swimming, another fish was the other direction towards them. And they paused and they you know, exchanged fish niceties. And before they separated to go back you know, to their uh, opposite directions, the one fish said to the other two, he said, have a good day. The water's fine. And the other two fish looked at each other and said, what's water? You see, we exist within God's very presence, but we don't notice it. It's as much a part of our existence as the air around us, but we don't notice it. Because we're so distracted. We're so dealing with things like the job and the mortgage and the family and the kids and, and so many things are going on in life. We're so distracted by what we see. We lose tr connection with what we don't see but that which we know by faith, and that is that God is. He is all and in all. In him we live and move and have our being. God is not out there somewhere. He's not a Superman. He's not a Santa Claus. He's not a, a, a Zeus or a Jupiter or someone who's playing chess with the world. He is the world and is all that is beyond the world. He is never, ever separated from us. I learned this when I was 16. I was, um, I was raised in a very devout Christian home, but when I was a young teen, my dad left and the family fell apart and my life fell apart. And, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon story, is it? And, you know, as, as a middle teen, I did what middle teens do when they, uh, their life is falling apart, and I became more and more rebellious and, you know, started carrying a switchblade to school and got into fights, started drinking heavily. And um, I remember when I was 16 years old, I, ran a, I was with a bunch of Christians, Jesus people. We talk, I've talked about Jesus people before. Jesus people, they're all excited. They're playing guitars in the parks, you know. They're all happy. And they have a great peace in their life, and I didn't have any peace. And I knew that I'd been raised in the church, but I didn't have any peace. I didn't have any relationship with God. And I remember uh, praying by, you know, all by myself. Nobody, you know, wasn't didn't wasn't in the, you know, down at the altar of a Billy Graham crusade. Just prayed all by myself and said, "Jesus, if you come back to me, I promise I won't ever leave you again." And I remember hearing the voice of God right there. 
say to me, I've never left you. He can't leave us. He is the very essence of our being, of everyone's being. This, con this idea of us being separated from God is really a pagan concept. It's not the God who declares himself, I am. I am love. I am truth. My grandmother was a Pentecostal. And uh, she had an interesting thing about her. She, she'd always kind of, you know, like, like a good grandmother, she's always kind of got me out of the corner of her eye. And she seemed to know just as about as I was about to do something that I shouldn't. And she'd wag her finger at me and she says, God is watching you. As if, it's something, God, it's something we need to be afraid of. <laughs> we need to hide from God. Jonah tried that. He thought, well, sure, if I can just get out of Israel, I won't have to, you know, answer God because God, God can't hear me outside of Israel. In the ancient Jews concept, God lived inside the temple in Jerusalem. He sat on the Ark of the Covenant. They called it the mercy seat. That's where God sat. So Jonah doesn't like what God wants him to do, so he says, well, I'll just leave town. God won't be able to see me. But Jonah discovers there's no running away from God. I mean, the prophets were constantly trying to move people to understand God is the God of the whole earth. God is the God of the whole universe. He doesn't live in some little temple. He doesn't sit on top of those golden angels. He is all and is in all. I'm going to do a special session, which I'll just put online because I don't want to give everybody a headache. You have to kind of volunteer for this one, which is basically on theological implications of quantum mechanical theory. And, and if, if just that phrase is frightening to you, there's probably not a session you want to, to, to listen to. But I want to make this point. We all, you know, when you go to school, not when I went to school, but if you went to school after, you know, it, where you, you, you learn a little bit more about, you know, the inner workings of matter and that matter is it, itself is almost an illusion. It's, it's really energy. Everything, everything that the, the world is made up is, is energy at a vibration and you slow the vibrations down and, and everything sinks into a singularity and the entire earth will fit inside a teacup if you slow the vibrations down. You speed the vibrations up too much and then you have thermonuclear explosions, right? The energy, it, matter ceases to exist and it all just turns into energy and just goes everywhere. But you dig down beyond that, but jump beyond the, the atomic level into the, uh, the quarks, the upside, up quarks, down quarks, sideways quarks, you know, and, and all the various little, what is it, 137 identified uh, particle, subatomic particles now. They keep trying, to, they keep discovering new ones. You dig down past that, and you know what the entire universe is made out of? Tiny, tiny strings that vibrate in 11 dimensions. And the harmony created by these tiny strings de develop, generates the energy that we see, that eventually we see as matter. In other words, in every atom of every cell of your being, God is singing to you a love song. The entire universe is made of music. The psalmist writes, two things I know. With God, 
belong, to God belong all power. And with you, O Lord, is unfailing love. When we begin to see that the entire universe exists because of this divine energy, this divine power that permeates everything, suddenly the incarnation doesn't just make sense, it becomes a necessity for the universe to function. The creator and creation are by nature one and the same. Now, of course, whenever I, I teach on this, people start to get nervous and they start thinking, oh my, he's not a pantheist, isn't he? I'm not saying that the rocks and trees are, are gods. No, not at all. But that everything that exists, exists because it exists in God who is I am, who is all being, and who relates to us. We experience God through his nature of truth and his nature of love. Now what happens, of course, is we really would like things to go differently. Picture it this way. God has given to each of us this tremendous privilege of existence in a physical universe. That we get to exist in this physical universe with physical bodies interacting with other physical bodies and interacting with the nature around us. And it's like we're on a treasure hunt. That God has us going through life in search of gold and silver and diamonds. And we can do that because we exist in this physical realm where we can interact with one another and interact with nature. But the gold and the silver and the diamonds that we collect on this treasure hunt are not the stuff that, we're the, that get left behind. It's not the stuff that gets burned, not the stuff that wastes away and, and rusts away after we're gone. The treasure that we collect in this sphere are those three things that last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And as we go through this life storing up in this treasure house of heaven the increase of faith, hope, and love in our lives, we are transformed into the very image of God himself. So that when we go to be with him, we will be unified with him and one with him. I mean, most of us will, are much more concerned about amassing the easy stuff, right? Yes, I am. We like the easy stuff, not the hard stuff like faith, hope, and love that requires perseverance and patience and, and giving and sharing and self-sacrifice. We would all think, I think, kind of want life to be a little easier. But Jesus made a very interesting promise. He did not promise our lives would be easier. In fact, he promised the exact opposite. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. The world hated me. You don't think they're not going to, it's not going to hate you? But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I am with you always to the end of the age. I know sometimes we would like to have that Superman God that we could might talk into things. <laughs> we might try to make our life easier for us. 
try to satisfy our, our wants and desires. But that's not God. God is the one who, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the turmoil of this world, he doesn't take the trouble away. He just walks with us through it because he fills our very being with himself. And when you think about it, that's enough. So I wanted to uh, try to open it up for, for questions. Um, and then I was going to sing a song because the cantor who was supposed to sing didn't show up. So <laughs> I guess couldn't make it. So um, any questions? I've got your microphone now because my microphone quit. Anybody got any questions? Cheryl. Why do people need some sort of God? And why do they want That's an excellent question. Um, I thought I just did. Why do people need some sort of God and why do they want or need God to be someone who gives or takes away? All right. Um, you know, it's a fascinating thing that of all the creatures on this planet, which there are millions of species of creatures on this planet, only one species prays. That's us. Human beings are hardwired to know God. The scripture puts it this way, that we are made in God's image. But what that really means is, is that we are created with a spiritual nature in which we are hardwired to know God. And so we, all humans, have this need to have that, that experience with God, that knowledge of God, satisfied. However, the scripture talks about the fall of Adam and Eve. At the, at the very essence of that story, Adam and Eve, you know, the serpent tempts Eve, says, you will be like God. There's a desire, a selfish desire, on the part of humanity to control God, to be able to use God for their own purposes, whether they're looking for the Santa Claus God or the vending machine God or the Superman God, some way in which we can, by our action, bring God to do what we want. This is the difference between faith and magic. Magic is all about getting God to do what I want. Faith is me trusting God and entrusting myself to what God wants, giving myself to God. And humanity, unre unrepentant humanity, unconverted humanity, let me say, prefers magic to faith prefers to manipulate and get from God rather than give ourselves to him. Does that answer your question? All right. Other questions? <laughs> 